is living now. This is living now. Take me higher than I've been before. It's your perfect love that sees me soar. Got no freedom is an open door. You are everything I want and more. Take me higher than I've been before. It's your perfect love that sees me soar. Got your freedom is an open door. You are everything I want and more. All right. Here we go. Now, this is living now. All right, keep it going. You take me higher than I've been before. It's your perfect love that sees me so. Got your freedom is an open door. You are everything I want and more. You take me higher than I've been before. It's your perfect love that sees me so. Got your freedom is an open door. You are everything I want and more. You got it right there at the end. All right. Hey, listen. Meet and greet time, but say where you're at. It's flu season. So just point and wave and nod and say, hello, how are you? Good to see you. All right. You know, don't touch each other. Keep it clean. Well, it's always good to do that, you know. If you still need hand sanitizers in the back, go ahead. I feel like you got to get sanitized up. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so Fight still I'm found Leaves the 99 I couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Dolly overwhelm me Never ending Reckless love of God
coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No shadow you won't light up, now you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. No mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. God, thank you for your never-ending love that you give to us. That even when we walk from you and even when we turn away and we, we may, God, not be loyal to who you are, God. You are always loyal to us. Your reckless love abandons all rights that you have and gives everything to us. Thank you for your everlasting love. Thank you that, God, we can come to you today and no matter what our past, no matter what we're going through, even right now, God, we can surrender our lives to you. We can come to a place where we find forgiveness. We can come to a place where we can find healing. We can come to a place where we find wholeness in you. So, God, I pray today for those in this place who are hurting, for those that words have been spoken that have cut deep, for feelings of betrayal, for feelings of, of loss, for those today, God, who are in the middle of a decision that has to be made, God, may you bring clarity to them. And God, may they bring everything they have and everything they ever hope to be, and may they bring it before you, God, and lay it at your feet and say, this is all I have great thing about your love, God, is you say, that's all I need. Just bring me all you have. I'll bring you through. I'll bring you healing. I'll bring you wholeness. I'll bring you hope. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgive was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the fathers are open wide. Forgiveness was born with 
God, this morning, we just come before you, broken. God, that, that song speaks of not a place physically, but a place in our hearts. We come and we humble ourselves before who you are. And God, as you move upon hearts and lives in this place, God, in this moment, in this time, God, there are broke, there's brokenness all around us. There are those today that, that are struggling, that are going through dark times, hurtful times. But God, today, they can come to you and they can find healing. They can come to you today and they can find wholeness in you. You take the broken pieces of our lives and you do something miraculous with them. 
So God, I pray you move upon those lives right now. You're here this morning. I just feel like we need to take out this time to do this. If you are, if there's anything you need from God today, I know that many are sick here today. I know that some of us have been fighting sickness. But all, all of us have something that we're broken from on the inside. All of us have something that we're struggling with. The beautiful part about who God is is he knows us all personally. So I want to open up what we call, we call this an altar down front. It's just kind of the place we come. We kind of bring our problems and bring our burdens to God and we just kind of lay them down. And I know that I've been talking to several families in the church that have, been, have received some tragic news this week and some that are going through real heartbreak in a daily life. And I don't know where you're at, but here's what I want to do. I just want to open up. If you have something you need from God, something that you're in the middle of, something you're going through, would you just step off from where you're at and come down front? We just want to pray with you and just want to ask God to touch you, no matter how great or small it is. Would you just come out right now? Just find a place down here. Maybe you just stand or you can kneel, whatever you feel like doing. Just come where you're at and uh, just come and find a place all around this place. Just come and find a place and whatever you have from God today. Can we just take this time and pray for families that are struggling and families that are being challenged from sickness and from division, whatever it is that we're going through today. We're gonna to sing this song. It's about the power and the presence of God's love. And as we sing it, come. Let's pray. Let's ask God to touch us. Love came down and rescued me. Love came down and set me free. I am yours. I am forever yours mountain high or valley low I sing out and remind my soul I am yours I am forever love yours love came down, sing that again love came down and rescued me love came down set I am yours, I am forever yours. Mountain high or valley low, I sing out and remind my soul, I am yours, I am forever yours. I am yours, I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. Oh, I, I am yours. Yes, all my days, Jesus, I am yours. Love came down and rescued me. Come on, you need anything from God today. Love came down Just cry out to Him. His amazing love. I am yours. I sing out and remind my soul 
I am yours. I am forever yours. Maybe you didn't come forward today, but right there we at it. Everybody just bow your head, just close your eyes and you need something from God today, you need direction, you need answers, you need favor, you need healing. You need God to speak in a way that's very clear, whatever it is that you're going through. You just need clarity in your life. Maybe you need a healing in your body, maybe physically, but maybe it's a healing in your relationships, or it's a healing in your marriage, or it's a healing in some aspect of your life. And no matter where you're at all across this place, if you have a need today, would you just lift your hands all across to the one who loves us, who cares for us, who knows us, who understands the fears and the struggles of our lives with hands raised all over. Would you just right now begin to ask God, whatever that is you need, just begin to cry out to him. Just begin to tell him what it is that you're looking for and just ask him, simply ask. He loves you. He cares for you. He looks down upon you. And, and even though you may not do everything perfect, he loves and cares and smiles because you are his and he is yours. His love is for you today. So God, I pray. I pray that God, you would move upon the hearts and lives. You would heal the brokenness and you would touch those God who are struggling today. May they know they're not alone. And as they journey, direct their steps, God. And as they walk, may they hear from you. May they know who you are and what you can do. Nothing is impossible for you, God. So God, I pray, speak to hearts, speak to minds, bring peace into places of chaos, bring healing into those who are broken today. Because God, there's nothing that you cannot do. So Lord, we thank you, we praise you, because we know that your love is everlasting. And there is none like you, God. Sing that one more time. I am yours. I am yours. All my days. Jesus, I am yours. We are yours, God. I am yours. Oh, I are yours. I am yours. Jesus, I am yours. Thank you for God calling us and making us your own. As we walk, keep your hand upon us. God, and direct our steps. God, and as we learn more about these forgotten virtues of our lives, not just help us to learn, but help it to be instilled and flow from within us, God. These virtues that flow every day in Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for worshiping this morning. of a series that is called Forgotten Virtues. And uh, we've been on a journey over the last several weeks, over the last four weeks, this is our fifth week, that we've been looking at some of these virtues that our culture has seemed to forget about. They have forgotten certain things and certain characters, characteristics that God encourages us to do. Now, it may not be called a virtue in the Bible, but virtues are, in essence, qualities that are of God, by God, that he wants us to demonstrate in our lives. They are, in essence, uh, throughout Scripture, these may not be said specifically, but these are virtues that are implied by God in order for us to do. And if you remember our first week, we talked about honor. We talked about that we are to honor the people in authority that are over us, whether that be your boss whether that be your parents, if that's the government officials, if that's the president of the United States, God calls us to honor that position or that person, that person over you that's placed in that position. Okay, if you agree with me, say, that's right. that's right. 
steps, right, right? And even though in the Bible it may not say, besides honor your father and mother, it doesn't say necessarily for politicians or for officials, uh, for representatives, but Jesus said, we're going to honor those in authority that we're under. We're going to honor them because, remember, respect is earned, but honor is given. So we honor those in authority over us. And then our second week we talked about in a very unclean, unsanitary, impure world that there is the forgotten virtue of purity, that God calls us to live a pure life, not to be perfect because that'll never happen. That will never be achieved. There is only one perfect person, as you know, and it's Jesus Christ. But we're called to think purely the best that we can, to, to um, talk purely, to live our lives purely, to take our, keep our bodies pure from impurities. Uh, and so we talked the first week that in an impure world where anything goes and whatever feels right, do it. Uh, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's all a lie that God calls us to purity, the forgotten virtue of purity. And all of us that agree with that say, Amen. right? Yep. Preach on. You got it. Good. All right. Then, uh, then our third week, we talked about in a world full of relationships that are kind of come and go as you want and in a world full of social media that if you don't like what somebody says, you unfriend them, you block them, you do whatever you want to them because why? Well, I, I don't need to be loyal to them because I see what they're doing and not being loyal to me. And you remember that week is the way I said loyalty or disloyalty is hard to see by looking in the mirror. We no, none of us here think we're disloyal. Because every time we uh, possibly can look like disloyalty, we justify the disloyalty that we're doing. We always have a justification for the disloyalty that we're doing. And so that week we learned that the forgotten virtue of loyalty is that, that we need to strive to be loyal, faithful people. Loyal to our spouse, loyal to our families and kids, loyal to our workplaces, loyal to those in authority over us. We're loyal, not because they're doing everything right. We're loyal because of the virtue that lies inside of us called loyalty. Okay. Last week, I uh, talked about this amazing thing that we see more than, I think, any one of these, and it's the forgotten virtue of integrity. What is integrity? Integrity is your character and how you behave in private lines up with who you are and how you behave in public. Those two must match. Integrity is I am who I am, whether it's good or bad, you are who you are. Integrity can go both ways. You know this? We always think of integrity as, a, as this quality where we're like, well, they're integrity because they're making right choices. I tell you what, some people make poor choices and they just own it. That's integrity. They have integrity. They're at least owning the wrongness of their life or the wrongness of their decisions. And I say to them, those, they may not be doing anything right, but man, they're being integral about it. Because if you're not, if you're not who you are in public, doesn't line up with your, your private life, you're nothing more than what a hypocrite. A hypocrite is a drama, an actor, a player in a play that looks apart but does something else. And so if we say we're Christ followers and we, uh, we say we don't like gossip, then we don't give ear to gossip and we don't gossip. Why? Because we're people of integrity. If we say that this is how we handle our finances in public and yet deep down we have a gambling problem, that's a hypocrite because it's not a person of integrity. So God challenged us last week with the forgotten virtue of integrity. Today I want to talk to you about the forgotten virtue of gratitude. Turn your neighbor and say gratitude. Turn your... If you, okay, you don't have neighbors, turn around and look at somebody behind you and say, gratitude. <laughs> you always need a buddy in the first service to sit by because I'll have you turn a neighbor. You got to have one by you. Um, talking about gratitude today, in a world full of entitlement, in a world full of I deserve, I deserve, I want, I want, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, and when they get it, they're not satisfied with it. In a world full of ungratefulness, in a world full of, we live in the greatest country that's ever been created, and yet Americans whine and complain probably more than lots of the rest of the world that have a lot more reasons to gripe and complain. I want to talk about gratitude. And I want us to look at uh, a, a book today. We're going to look at a book and kind of dive into it, the book of Philippians. Uh, the book of Philippians is not actually a book. We call it a book because it's in the Bible, but it's actually a letter, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to this church in Philippi. 
And this church in Philippi, um, they were a pretty positive church. They were a church that was pretty optimistic. There were lots of great things that Paul wrote to the church in Philippi because of their optimism, because they had this outlook on life that no matter what they were going through, they were going to stay optimistic in where they were going. And in this letter that he writes, the words joy, rejoice, and be glad is said 17 times in this very brief little letter that he writes about. Because he wants to remind the people in Philippi, the church in Philippi, that listen, when you go through hard times and when you face many trials, when the pressure is on, whenever the world is against you, remember that God is with you and don't complain, don't grumble, don't whine, just live peacefully with the joy that is in your heart. Now, show of hands here. How many of you guys just can't stand being around a complainer. Someone, they have something to complain about no matter where you're at, restaurant, food, clothes, uh, their job, uh, what's going on in the world, you know, they complain about it. How many do not like being around complainers? They're a killjoy. They suck the life out of you. They exhaust you. Raise them up high. Come on, raise them up high. All right, good, good. All right, good. So I'm a good company today. All of us can honestly say none of us really enjoy being around a complainer. Why? Because it's like with complainers, they're in competition with who's got the worst life. It's like they want to know, they, they, you, can, you, can, you can say something and they got a bigger, badder story because they're complainers. Now, I will say some people, some people, I know nobody here today, but some people are habitual complainers. I mean, you, if you spend one minute with them, they're off, <laughs> complaining about something. They got an ax to grind. They got somebody to talk about. They're ready, they're locked and loaded, man. You talk to them, and it's like, bang, there it is. You're in the middle of the complaining. Um, and God does not desire for us to work and live this way. This is not how God designed for us to live. God did not call us to turn darkness into light for us to complain about the light. It's too bright. I was in darkness. I couldn't see. I was in my sin, but now I'm in light, and it's too bright. Come on. We are called from darkness to light, and we're not called to be complainers. So stand to your feet with me this morning as we read our, our passage, Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 through 15. It says this. It says, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may be blameless, uh, become blameless and pure children of God without fault, a crooked and depraved generation. Uh, I'm sorry, without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like the stars in the universe. Father, help us today to learn how not to be complainers. Help us to see Maybe that we are, so that, God, we can learn how not to be. I pray that, God, your word speaks into our hearts today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. So there's different kinds of complainers. I want to give you four different kinds of complainers today, okay? The first one that I want to talk to you about is the, the whiner, the whiner complainer. Okay, and this this would come. This person's favorite phrase is "life is not fair." The whiner complainer goes around saying, "Life is not fair. This should not be done with me." They don't rise and shine; they rise and whine. They're whiners, and you know who they are. You know who they are. David was a whiner in the psalmist. He continually whined about his life. Psalm 73, verse 13 says, Have I been wasting my time? Why take all the trouble to be pure? All I get out of it is trouble and woe. Oh, poor woe is me. I'm so mistreated. I'm so mistreated. My boss hates me. I can't do anything right for my husband. I can't do anything right for my wife. I'm a whiner. It's the Charlie Brown mentality. Why is everybody always picking on me? The whiners of life. It's not fair. I don't deserve this. Everybody else gets a break, and I'm just left in the dust. 
Scripture says they took their money and started grumbling against the employer. Why? Why put up the whole day work in the hot sun? You get paid the same as you paid us, Matthew 20, verse 11 and 12. Life's not fair. God, why are you allowing me to go through this? Life's not fair. And I'm here to tell you, if you're a whiner, guess what? Accept it. Life is not fair. And nowhere is it promised that life would be fair. The time that life will become fair is when we all reach the other side. Those who go to heaven will receive their just rewards, and those who choose to reject Christ will, re will, will receive the punishment that's deserved them. That's fair. But while we journey here, life is not fair. If we complain and we whine and we complain and we whine, we're only making life harder because we're focused on us instead of focused on God. So first off was the whiner. The second one is this, the martyr or the victim, Why, a victim complainer, the martyr or the victim. Their favorite phrase is, no one appreciates me. Everybody takes me for granted. No one appreciates what I do for them. Moses said to the Lord, he said this. This is Moses we see in his life. He said, why, why pick me to give a burden of the people like this? I, I can't carry this nation by myself. If you're going to treat me like this, please kill me right now. It will be kindness to me. Let me out of this impossible situation. Moses was a victim and a martyr, and you know who these people are. These people walk with a victim mentality from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed. And, and, and if, you're, if you're around a person like this for any amount of time, you start feeling sorry for them. And yet, really? Moses here is whining and complaining about something that God said, I've already given you what you need. Stop complaining. They, they're the ones, they throw their own pity party and they invite a bunch of people to come and no one joins them, no one joins them. And then they're like, see, I told you, no one cares. I'm taking advantage of, no one appreciates me. How do you react when things don't go your way? How do you react whenever you feel unappreciated? Do you whine, do you complain, or do you ask God to fill you up? The third is the cynic, the cynic complainer. The cynic's favorite phrase is, nothing will ever change. It's just the way it is. That's just who I married. That's just how my kids are. That's just how my job is. Figures, there goes my life. They're the cynic. Nothing changes. Nothing gets better. And Ecclesiastes 1, 2, Solomon said it this way. He said, life is useless. You spend your life working and do what you have to show. And what do you have to show for it? The world stays just the same. What has been done before, it will be done again. The cynic sees it all the time. It never goes his way, never happens the way that it, he should. You know, uh, why? Why? You know, why, why? That last phrase, he says, what has been done before will be done again. That's referring to kids. I mean, if we clean it up, we got to go back and clean it up again. It's just the way it goes, you know? So the cynic says nothing ever changes. And then the last one is this, the last complainer, maybe this may be you, maybe somebody you know, uh, the perfectionist, the perfectionist. Their phrase is this, you're doing it wrong. I know how to do it better. The perfectionist finds a flaw in everything you do. You may put your best foot forward, but they will find something wrong with what you've done. The perfectionist. Uh, the perfectionist, the scriptures that I have. Now, listen, I'm going to read this passage to you today, but I want you to understand that as I read, this is a universal uh, principle. Scripture is speaking of a certain gender, but it's universal. And here's what it says. Proverbs 27, 15, a nagging wife is like a, a water constantly dripping, drip, drip, drip on a rainy day. Another proverb says it this way. Proverbs 21, verse 19, better to live in the desert than live with a nagging, complaining wife. Another proverb says, better to live on a corner of a roof than live with a nagging wife. Pastor Joe and I were talking. We're going to create, you know, in these houses now, you have all these wooden signs everywhere. They have these cute little sayings on there. 
We're going to create one, and you can't seal this because we already came up with it. We're going to create one. She's going to put by the front door, and it's going to say, this way to the roof. <laughs> uh, we thought it was hilarious, didn't we, Joe? That's right. Not that our wives complain. We just thought it'd be funny for every other guy out there that their wives complain. The perfectionist, it's never good enough. No matter how hard you try, they have a complaint on how they can do it better. It's never right. Always pushing and nagging. This is men and women. Are you any one of those? Are you the whiner? Are you the victim? Are you the cynic? Or are you the perfectionist? What do you complain about? Nothing destroys the warmth of a home more than complaining. Nothing destroys the harmony inside of a marriage more than complaining. Nagging does not work. It just upsets everyone. So how do we conquer complaining? Ask me how. Okay, I tell you're enthusiastic about hearing this. Here's how you conquer complaining. First one is this. First thing is admit that you have a problem. Scripture says do everything without complaining, without arguing. Proverbs 23, 28, verse 7, 13, it says, A man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful, but if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. Complaining is hard to hear for yourself. Complaining is something that you rarely... Remember I said loyalty is hard to see when you look in a mirror? Complaining is hard to to hear of yourself. Because again, you justify the complaints. You justify your position. You justify where you're at. But my question to you is this. If someone was to record one day of your life, what would it sound like? If someone was to, to replay the words that you say out of your mouth to whoever, your, your wife, your husband, your kids, uh, your boss, your, your friends, your co-workers, what would it say? Would it be complaint free or would it be riddled with complaints and cynicism and negativity? You first have to say, I have a problem. Complaining is not just a bad habit. Complaining is a sin. You say, what do you mean, Pastor Kevin? Well, we see throughout Scripture that the Israelites were taken from bondage and slavery and given into freedom and given into a, a life of freedom. And what did they do? They constantly, the word says, they grumbled and complained against God. We were better off as slaves. We, you, here you brought us out here and we're going to die out here. We could have died in Pharaoh's place. Seven times the scripture says they murmured or they complained against God. It's not just a habit. It's a sin. So we must first look at ourselves. Can I tell you? How do you know if you complain? What are your kids like? What do they say? Here's your sign. Number two, accept responsibility for my own life. Accept responsibility for my own life. Complaining wants to blame others. Complaining always looks to it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, instead of it's my fault. Proverbs 19 verse 3 says, some people ruin themselves by their own stupid mistakes, and then they blame the Lord. Yeah. Stop pointing the finger and take responsibility for yourself. I hear so many people complain about so many different things. I hear so many people complain. They come to me and they want prayer. They want prayer. They want to complain is what they want to do. And they come and they complain to me and they complain about, I'm in debt. I, you know, I want to tithe. I want to give God, I want to give God, you know, my, my first fruits. I want to give God my first 10% back, but I can't because I'm in so much debt. I can barely make it as it is. I'm, I'm in debt and I want to get out of debt. And yet these are the same people that 
uh, that will walk around and have brand new shoes and brand new pants that they charge on their credit card. These are the same people that, that justify every purchase they have because why? They really don't want to get out of debt. They just want to complain about it but never see a change. They don't take responsibility for that change. Husbands and wives come to me and they want a better marriage. And they want to, they're, they're on the brink of, of divorce and separation uh, and, and going their separate ways. And I, I tell them, I say, hey, here's some ideas. You know what? They don't really want to change. They just want to complain about their spouse, complain about it, and blame them. It's their fault. If they were different, we'd be better. Kids complaining about their parents, complaining about their parents don't do this and their parents don't do that. And they look at other friends and they see what they got and they go, my parents never did that. They complain. Job is not good enough to complain instead of taking responsibility. Here's what we need to know. We reap what we sow. What we invest, we get back. If you want friends, you need to be friendly. If you want appreciation, you need to appreciate the people in your life. If you want a good marriage, you put marriage first. We reap what we sow. What we sow. You want respect, you give respect. We accept responsibility. See, there's three kinds of people in this category that don't accept responsibility. There's, a, ex, there's accusers, excusers, and there is choosers. Accusers, excusers, and choosers. Accusers, it's your fault, your fault, and your fault. Excusers, they say, I'm a product of my environment. My parents raised me, and this is just who they raised, and this is just who I am, and this is just how it goes, and I'm not responsible for what I do. My dad did it to me. He ruined me. He messed me up. My mom messed me up. And so the, the excusers excuse away their behavior because they have the past that they can blame it on. But then there's choosers. And choosers are people who decide, you know what, yeah, I may have had a horrible past, and yeah, I may have had things done to me, and yeah, there are people that do horrible things in this planet, on this planet, in this world, but I'm going to take responsibility for my own decisions. I'm going to own up. I'm going to accept it. I made a mistake. I sinned. I failed, and I move on. I choose Christ, and I choose to move on, to be successful in my life. So we admit we take responsibility. Number three, we develop an attitude of gratitude. We develop an attitude of gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks. What does it say? It says what? What's that? Give thanks. Say that next word. Give thanks in all. In all. Give thanks in all, not give thanks for all. Scripture says, give thanks in all. When we, we're not giving thanks for the bad circumstances that are coming away, but while we're in them, we give thanks to God in all circumstances, for this is God's will. Not God's will that we're going through bad things, but God's will that we give thanks. This scripture is very distorted at times because we say, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will. So the circumstances I'm going through is God's will. No, I'm saying while you're in the circumstances, you are. We are to give thanks in the middle of very hard circumstances, not for, but in. Are you a cup half full person? Are you a cup half empty person? Do you see life from a sunny side or do you see life from the, from the dead doldrum dark side? How do you see life? See, we in America, we live in the greatest country has ever been on the planet. And yet, around the world, do you realize statistically, Americans, in view of the rest of the world, complain and whine about more stuff than any other country? Why is that? Well, because we have an entitlement mentality. We feel entitled, and because we feel entitled, we feel justified by our complaining. So as Christians, we're called to be different. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 says, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance may be. And Paul, when he's writing this letter, he's writing from a prison. He's writing from a place of starvation. He's writing from a place that he probably wasn't, he probably had wounds and sores all over his body. He was beaten. He was abused. He was neglected. He had many reasons to whine. He had many reasons to be a victim. He had every reason to be a, a cynic because all he saw was the next day was the prison life he was in. 
But what did he do? What did he do? He said, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I face. What did he do? He said, I have learned the secret. What is the secret? The secret is I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How are we thankful in the middle of very painful, trying uh, st- circumstances that hurt us and cut deep? How are we thankful? Because I can do, not in me, all things through who? Christ, who strengthens us. We admit, we take responsibility, we develop an attitude of gratitude. Number four, look for God's hand in the circumstances that you're facing. If you want to get victory over complaining, look for what God is doing behind the scenes. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, this small and temporary trouble we suffer will bring us tremendous and eternal glory much greater than the trouble. So fix our attention, not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. What is seen only lasts for a time, but what is unseen will what? It will last forever. Paul had every reason in the world to gripe and complain and whine and, 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 and complain about where he's at. But instead, he said, nope, I'm going to keep my eyes on what God is doing. He wrote some of his most impact, impacting letters from that place in prison. And he is, he's been impacting the world by his words for thousands of years since. Positive people realize that God is in control and and controlling all circumstances. God is fitting everything to the pattern and to the purpose that is for his greatness. The challenge is, many times we question God's wisdom, we doubt God cares, and we forget God's goodness. So when we're going through circumstances, we, we question, God, what are you doing here? We doubt he really cares about us when we're going through the circumstances because of maybe decisions we've made. But most importantly, we forget he's a good God. And because he's good, he wants good for his children. Think about your own child. Not a one of us would, if our children really needed us, not a one of us would turn our back and say, nope, figure it out yourself. I'm done with you. No, we would do whatever we could to bring them up, to help them so that they could find healing. So we need to remember God's goodness. Admit that we have a problem, accept responsibility, develop an attitude of gratitude, look uh, to God. And finally, here's the last one, number five, practice speaking positive. Practice speaking positive. Complaining is a habit. Habits are broken through the opposite taking place. If you are in a habit of eating Oreo cookies every night, you're in that habit You have to replace that with something else in order to to diffuse the habit. And and, and psychologists say a habit is broken on average 66 days. It takes 66 days on average to to break any habit and to pick up any good habit. 66 days. And with that in mind, we have to think about what are the things in my life that I am complaining about habitually and I need to replace it with positive talk, okay? So here's how it works. If you're complaining about your husband and what he's not doing over and over and over again, look for the good things he does. It may be hard to find, but you can find something, okay? Same's true for guys. Guys, you're complaining all the time what your wife's not doing, how she's not doing this or that. Look for something positive and focus on that. Your kids are making stupid decisions and stupid mis- mistakes over and over again, and it's hard to like get it through their head instead of complaining and nagging them. Why don't you start looking at some positive things they are doing? Start looking at some good in them. Ephesians 4, 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth except for that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit, it says this, that it may benefit who? It may benefit those who, listen, are you speaking positively into your world around you? Do you build up or do you tear down? 
Criticism and complaints will always bring down. Affirmation and positive buildup will build them up. Ephesians 6, 4 says, don't keep scolding and nagging your children, making them angry, resentful. Rather, bring them up in a loving, disciplined, and godly advice. Be positive in how we speak. And if we do this, if we, if we learn how to stop complaining and be more positive and be more uh, life-giving in our words, here's here three results it says in that scripture that we read at first in, in uh, Philippians. It says, if we do it, it says, do everything without complaining. It says this, so that you may become blameless. The first one is, we will become blameless. And it says, children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation, which shine like the stars in the universe will become blameless. We will shine like the stars. And the last one says, they shine like stars in the middle of a dark night. We will radiate God's goodness throughout our life. The point that Paul was saying, he's saying, if you're a Christian, we should be different. Everyone else in your work that you talk with may complain about the same thing that you also feel verified and justified about complaining about. But God says you be different and you focus on the positive. You don't go along with them because that's not how we witness who God is. The world would know you're different by your fruit that you bear. How I desire for Crossview to be a church that when it's talked about the people who call Crossview their home, they're talked about positively. That they're not talked about, oh man, that lady just complains about everything. I wouldn't want to go to church there. That, that cross you is a place of love and unity and, and harmony. That's a place where Jesus is the center and all we care about is serving him with our lives and representing him, representing him well in this world we call our home. So, the conclusion of forgotten virtues what is it that you need God to help you with? Do, do you need help in the area of honor? Do you need to honor some people in positions over you that you have dishonored? Do you need to change your attitude and ask God to help you be a person of honor? Do you, is it purity? Are there thoughts that you have? Are there, are there things that you're doing privately and that they're impure? Websites that you go to and, and com communication that you say and, and people you talk with, impure, and you need God to help you find purity in your life. Is it loyalty? Are you a loyal person? Or the minute you get ticked at that person, you disloyal from the day to night, as long as the day is, you're disloyal. Is it integrity? Does your private life line up with your public life? Or is it gratitude? You're so blinded by the complaining and the negativity and the, 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 the um, you feel so justified by, your, by your, your negativity that you complain and gripe and talk and nag and you don't even realize what you're doing, but yet the virtue you need is gratitude. What do you need from God today? Bow your heads with me this morning as we pray and ask God to guide and direct us in the forgotten virtues of our life. Father, we come before you right now. We just ask you, God, to search us. God, maybe there's not just one we need help with. Maybe we need help with two or three. Or God, we need help with all of them. Honor, purity, loyalty, integrity, and gratitude. God, may you help to stir our hearts to discover the beauty, the blessed life we can have on the other side of these amazing virtues. Search us, God. Speak to us. Give us exactly what we need from you, God. In Jesus' name. came down and rescued me love came down and set me free i am yours i am forever yours mountain high or valley low i sing out and remind 
my soul I am yours I am forever yours I am yours I am yours all my days Jesus I am yours I am yours oh I I am yours all my days Jesus I am yours Father God, help us today just to take in our hearts these forgotten virtues. Help us to reflect them wherever we go and with whoever we have in, uh, in contact with. Help us to exemplify who you are, Christ, through our lives. May we be the greatest representatives of Jesus Christ wherever we go, whether in our work, whether in our, our school system, in our, our universities. God, whether, whether we're going through uh, just the checkout line and, and we're walking through this community, what we post on social media and what we put out there for people to see, God, help us to, to remember these amazing virtues, honor, purity, loyalty, integrity, and gratitude. And God, when we walk through this life, may we represent Christ well. Everywhere we go, everywhere we walk, and every person we communicate with, God, teach us these forgotten virtues. I pray that, God, you keep your hand upon us, guide and direct us, help us, God to continually walk with you every day. In Jesus' name. Everybody said.